today, as you see, um, I decided to title it Recollecting, and it's a kind of a play word between uh, recalling and recollecting. So I didn't know how to keep both words and just decided to kind of do a butcher the English, uh, so to speak, and do it. Um, the, the presentation today really comes out uh, not of the book, but of what it should have been before this book came out. In reality, as I uh, wrote this book, I realized that there was a whole lot of research that I needed to do that hasn't been done and that needed to be fleshed out, and I am trying to, to do that. Um, so let's go and see what happens. The common basic understanding of the notion of mestizaje is that it points to the condition of intermixture in historical terms. It marks the point of violent encounters between the multiple indigenous communities and the Spanish Portuguese. In terms of theology, with only one exception, it is the groundbreaking work of Latino theologians that amplified the scope of mestizaje to aspects of biblical hermeneutics, appreciation of popular religious activities, and the cultural condition and character of faith experiences, identity formation, and theological knowledge. They originally deployed mestizaje as the result of historical encounters that brought about complex processes of cross fertilization Implicit in their work is the notion that mestizaje can function as hermeneutical lenses through which we can reread the history of Latin America and Latinos and from that vantage point reflect theologically. Although unintentionally, as Latinos revisited the historical multiple intersecting paths of violence in our past, they showed that the notion of mestizaje is not neutral, not, nor can it be sanitized. For example, to speak of mestizaje as occurring out of romanticized mutual exchanges undermines the violent ideological edifice upon which such exchanges were predicated. To celebrate only the historical intersection of peoples in construction of something new runs the risk of committing historical amnesia, that is, of forgetting altogether the cultural genocide, suffering, and silencing of entire living peoples, indigenous and later Afro-descendants, and their, their own ethno-historical and cultural memory and legacy. And to emphasize the historical violence alone leaves us bereft of an, of an appreciation of the multiple ways in which life breaks out anew, even from within destructive historical moments. So what I am proposing is that the interwoven multiple levels of violence, resistance, and cross-fertilization simultaneously point to a larger story that needs to be uncovered and mapped out, which is what I'm trying to do. The story is disconcerting, painful, jarring, at once hopeless and hopeful, cuts across multiple disciplines, and has taken many permutations. In other words, mestizaje, more appropriately, refers to the intersection of multiple social, political, economic, literary, historical, contextual, racialized, and gendered factors that cannot be reduced to a single phenomenon. Today, I will discuss three, three samples of the richly diverse expressions of mestizaje from the different fields of literature, history, and politics correspondingly and which form part of the larger genealogy or family of expressions of mestizaje. So the first one, I titled it From Amnesia to Remembering. The first strand is Ricardo Fernstein novel in 1994 titled Mestizo. The story is about a man who is the only witness to a crime. The shock of seeing a woman from being murdered affects his memory. The police takes him to, a, to, a, to the precinct to provide them with information about the incident. As he is ready to provide the narration, he realizes he doesn't remember who he is. He doesn't carry any ID with him. So at the precinct, he claims, quote, I can't verify my name. What I have done in my life, what stitches of guilt and innocence embroidered the story of my life, end quote. 
With an old picture in his hand, he takes a stroll down memory lane and begins the painstaking task of recalling the past. And he does this by recollecting the multiple strands of his ancestor's story. In the novel, the investigation of the crime turns into an exploration of the unfolding longer, bigger, messier story occurring behind the curtains of recorded history. The reader is made privy to the minute details of the specific of the experience of migration of Jews into Argentina. The level of detail creates a play between this man's, con this man's condition of temporary amnesia and his eidetic memory. Through the eidetic shift that happens in the novel, readers are turned into the subjects of remembering, directed introspectively into their own journey towards piecing together their own sense of the past. First, the novel shows, draws on, sorry, hang on, let me stop. In. Just the lighting. Firstine's novel draws on the notion of mestizaje to elucidate the cultural experience of intermixture, intermixture of Argentinian Jews. In the introduction of the novel, Island Stevens tells us that mestizaje, that is for mestizo Jews, bespeaks of a cross fertilization that is cultural and not hereditary. The word mestizo denotes, quote, a person that with Jewish ancestry, born to Jewish immigrants in Argentina, and, al and who are almost paralyzed by this duality. Yet, complete cross-fertilization does not occur. The Jews in Argentina have remained separate from the larger population, and they find themselves in a perennial state of exile, never feeling fully at home and never fully welcome. Their memory is never pure. It is, quote, a bastard memory, end quote, that remains forever elusive. The emphasis on remembering in this dance-like back and forth flow between forgetting and reconnecting with the past becomes the foil for understanding the identity of these communities. But no full recollection takes place either. The author does not intend to measure his own notion of mestizaje against the longer history of the events of the Spanish and Portuguese conquest and the violation and systematic genocide of the indigenous. For him, that is something from the past. The indigenous people are assumed non-existent and are therefore even forgotten. They were annihilated around 1870 and the gauchos, that is the mestizos, have replaced them. As he writes, the events around the conquest are unique, but no longer describe what is taking place in the context of Latin America. In today's Latin, today's Latin America is oriented to the rest of the world, to a universal vision. First thing invites us to reconsider mestizaje then as a celebration of which the Latin American countries welcome the rest of the, of the world, in his case, the Argentinian Jews. He sees in Mestizaje the utopic future of integration of peoples as new identities in groups are birthing, which are the result of the global melange of cultural and ethnic groups. So that's the first one. The second one, which is to me one of the most interesting ones. What is in a name? Gomez Suarez de Figueroa or Garcilas or the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega. Known primarily for his Comentarios Reales in his Crónicas de la Florida, Gómez Suárez de Figueroa represents the chronological birthing point in the development of mestizaje discourses in Latin America. To my knowledge, he was the first writer from the Americas who self-consciously claimed mestizaje as self-describing identity label. Gomez Suarez de Figueroa was born right at the historical juncture when the first Spaniards arrived to today's Cusco, Peru, a mix with noble Inca women. His father was Don Sebastián Garcilaso de la Vega Vargas, who arose to prominence during the civil war between the conquistadors Francisco Pizarro and Diego de Almagro. Captain de la Vega Vargas quietly became, quickly became a man of trust for the Pizarro brothers, and for his military gifts, he was rewarded with a large piece of land. He took La Paya, or young women, Chimpuoclo, or Doña Isabel Niusta Yupanqui, as his concubine. She was a direct cousin of Atahualpa, a member of the royal Inca family. However, de la Vega Vargas never married Doña Isabel. 
At the beginning, the, Spaniard, the Spanish crown encouraged Spaniards, Spanish nobles to marry the Inca nobility in order to create military alliances. But soon after, it threatened Spaniards with losing their lands and encomiendas if they did not marry Spanish women. So De La Vega Vargas abandoned Doña Isabel, married Doña, Luis, Doña Luisa Martel de los Rios, and gave Doña Isabel to one of his lower ranking officers named Juan de Pedroche. De La Vega Vargas and Doña Isabel had a son, Gomez Suarez de Figueroa, in April 12, 1539, barely seven years after the invasion of Cusco by Pizarro's forces, and during the time of civil war among the conquistadors. After the separation of his parents, the boy remained with his father, who resolved to give him a good education, meaning Spanish education. Captain Garcilaso, Santiago Garcilaso de la Vega Vargas, didn't die, and in his will, he stipulated that Gomez Suarez de Figueroa be sent off to Spain. Upon arriving to Spain, Gomez Suarez de Figueroa traveled to the house of his uncle in Montilla, where he resided until his own death and where he finally reflected on his mixed condition and identity. Thank you. Hopefully now I don't make that many reading mistakes. So let's get to the real thing. Renaming and reclaiming the mestizo condition. To the children of a Spanish male and Indian women, or Indian male and Spanish women, they call us mestizos because we are the mix of both nations. It was imposed by the first Spaniards who had children with the Indian women and for being an imposed name by our fathers and because of its signification, I unashamedly use it for myself and feel honored by it. Although in the Indies, if anyone is told you are a mestizo, they take it offensively. A careful analysis of of this small quote reveals the ambiguity inherent in the general experience of being mixed in Spanish colonial societies. Gomez Suarez de Figueroa tell us that the term mestizo referred originally and exclusively to the intermixture of Spanish and indigenous. His description of mestizaje makes evident the uneven relationship of power between the Spaniards and indigenous people, and more specifically between the Spanish men and indigenous women. His adoption of the term was, bold, was a bold step at defining his own identity space, subverting the original stigma of being mixed. Nevertheless, the term remains controversial as people in the Americas find it offensive. Although not present in the quote, an important detail worth mentioning is that Gomez Suarez de Figueroa wrote this at the end of his literary career when he adopted the name Inca Garcilaso de la Vega. The adoption of the name represents his daring attempt at incorporating the elements of both his Spanish and Inca identities into one that reflected his own reality and condition of being mixed. Gomez Suarez de Figueroa's importance to mestizaje discourses relates most to his, more to his bold adoption of the term in order to carve out a social political space where mixed people could exist. How serious were his writings taken is reflected on the fact that his books were listed in the Index Librorum Prohibitum, banishing them from the Americas by the commission that led the Spanish Inquisition. It would not be until the time of the Wars of Independence that, that in Latin America, his writings were revindicated by El Protector Jose de San Martin. While in Montilla, Gomez Suarez de Figueroa lived a divided life, almost schizophrenic, he preferred to relate to people original from the Americas, mainly Peru. Yet, he also seemed to be looking for ways to belong to Spanish societies, which he found by becoming the noble captain of the Alpujarras, finding, fighting against the Moors, people mixed just like him. It is at this juncture, in this tension between his indigenous and his Spanish identities, that Gomez Suarez de Figueroa became the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega. The battleground of these identities was his Spanish translation of the Dialogi di Amore by Leon Ebre, or Dialogos di Amor, or Dialogues of Love. Now, Leon Ebreo was a pseudonym of a Sephardic Jew named Judas Abarbanel, original from Portugal. His choice of the book reveals much about his internal battle. 
León Hebreo opted exile with his father and people during the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, despite the queen's promise that he would remain unaffected. The content of the book served as a unique platform for de la Vega's personal reflection. Using platonic categories, the book remains and maintains the superiority of the spirit over matter, which in the case of the book is the sphere of reason and of the divine. Philon and Sophia, embodying knowledge and wisdom, the interlocutors in the dialogue discuss the tension between love and desire. But their goal is not to obtain love. Rather, they search for the union that is brought about by knowing love. This love is expressed in all aspects of life in our world, from the sun and the moon, the fauna and the flora, to the man and the woman. This love brings unity through intermixture. In this cosmic duality between the superior spiritual heavenly and the inferior mater material earthly, Leon Hebreo explains the relationship between the world and the divine and between the man and the woman. The man, the principle of masculinity, what is superior and spiritual by analogy, represented the celestial being who loves out of abundance and by his perfection wishes to be united with the woman, the principle of femininity, what is material and inferior in order to give her what she is lacking. This is not a subtle point that Hebreo makes. In his second dialogue, he interweaves the relationship between heaven and earth and man and woman at the level of sexuality. Indeed, he asserts that the union between a man and a woman, as inspired by love, is perfected by its own mutuality and reciprocity. The one, the man, seeks to love out of his abundance and the other, the woman, seeks to join in, in love out of her need. Just as the coital intimacy between heaven and earth resulted in the creation of the world by inference, when a man and a woman engage in sexual intercourse, the result is also, also the creation of something new. From this vantage point of intermixture, the book provides for De La Vega the necessary framing for rethinking his experience in constru and constructing his identity. Through this book, the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega began to reinterpret the world being created in the Americas. He began to see himself as a mestizo, and his latest writings will reflect this change. He arrives at a crossroads, which he must painstakingly resolve in order to come to terms with his mestizo condition. He interrogates, his interrogation of the issue provoked a rigorous self-examination. Quote, soy indio, soy mestizo, Soy español, am I Indian, am I mestizo, am I Spanish? At the court, some thought that I am Spaniard Indian. It might be because they heard me speak Castilian as my father did. The majority murmured, nah, he's Indian. He was the object of discrimination. He carried the stigma of being mixed and illegitimate. Most important, since his childhood, he had been trying to distance himself from his mother for being indigenous, but in the end, his Inca blood triumphs. Out of his internal struggle, he came to the realization that the natives of Peru were his relatives, and his mother was the all important link that united him to his Inca ancestry. In the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega's bold adoption of mestizaje represents then a radical reclaiming of his indigenous identity and an effort to keep his memory alive. It is also a defined posture of conceiving a different world with all of its contradiction, contradictions. It's strongly influenced by the love spirit dialectic of the theology de amore and in some way conceived that the Spaniards were in fact superior of the religion, De La Vega concluded that it was the divine will of the Christian God that brought the Spaniards to the continent. Along with their lust and greed for golden power, things which he identifies as the reason for the suffering of his Inca kin, they brought what the Inca people were missing, Christianity. In a hierarchy of indigenous groups where the Inca people were considered superior to others, he perceived that Inca teachings and society worked like a primer for evangelism, a preparatio evangelica. They prepared the people to convert, even willingly, to la Santa Madre Católica, Santa Madre Iglesia Católica. His own mother, he wrote, was greater for her conversion to Christianity than for her Inca lineage. De La Vega found in Christianity the complementing element lacking a la León Hebreo in his native relatives, but nothing else. 
The Spaniards did not improve Inca culture and society. So great in advance were the Incas that the center of Inca culture and society, Cusco, was another room prior to the coming, to the coming of the Spaniards. As the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega came to terms with his own mixed condition, he realized that this implies the preservation of the historical memory of his Inca relatives in his Historia del Peru. In saving the historical memory of the natives of Peru, in saving the historical memory of the natives of Peru from oblivion, he inaugurated the first version of indigenismo by a mestizo elite intellectual. Indeed, his writing represents the creation of a new interstice, intellectual culture and spiritual space within which those who are mixed are located. So his writings are also much more than that. He saw himself, himself as the representative, which really meant the replacement of the Incas. And as such, he saw he, and as such, he was member of the victims. Nonetheless, he was the seed of the conquistadors, and as such, he killed Indians to protect the Spanish crown. He also married a Moorish woman whom he despised, and he was father to a child that unfortunately reminded him of his indigenous ancestry. With all this tension and contradictions in his internal tug of war, he was compelled to ask the theological question, ¿Cómo escoge Dios el alma que da a los mestizos? How does God choose the soul? given to mestizos? The answer to this question can only be inferred. He is the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega. In him, both traditions found common ground. He represents, as do all mestizos and mestizas, the utopic ideal of Spanish and indigenous people coexisting. In the Inca, mestizos and mestizas then became the generation of the future world being built in the Americas. So there is progression in his work. Through conquest, the Incas elevated other indigenous tribes. With the cultural and religious advances, the Spanish would be responsible for taking the indigenous tribe of the Americas to their next stage of development. In the, in the La Vega size, the Spaniards were the paradigm of the most perfect realization of human existence. In his temporal dynamic of what was and what is, the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega saw the end of the indigenous past era and the future ushered in by the mestizo reality. The survival of the indigenous inevitably required them to adopt a Spanish culture and religion. So let me move. The development of a body politic in the Americas, Simon Bolivar. Sociocultural issues that triggered the wars of independence. I don't move too much. Thank you. The wars of independence in Latin America were the result of a complex web of factors. Over the years, there were numerous uprisings challenging the authority of Spain, Spain over the Americas. Although many mixed descendants were involved in these local uprisings, their situation was very ambiguous. Because of money or skin color, Many times, some mestizos and mestizas were able to climb the social ladder and become Spaniards, that is, white. And many times, others remained socially disadvantaged, just above the indigenous people and African descendants. By the end of the 18th century, the Criollos felt equally disadvantaged. They developed their identity and consciousness as a unique group rejected by the peninsulares, that is, a Spanish from the Spanish Peninsula. Although the term was originally broader in meaning, criollos came to be known as the children of Spanish parents born in the Americas. In every sense of the word, they were Spaniards. But from the perspective of the peninsulares, the, conten the continent, for being close to the tropic, had a detrimental mental effect on the natural development of peoples. So even Spaniards born in the region share the same fate. Part of the Part of what seemed to support the notion of tropicalism was the fact that the conquistadors, as the conquistadors and the criollo children settled or started settling in the regions, they began adopting some of the aspects of the indigenous and African cultures. Criollos, specifically or especially, were deeply influenced by the indigenous and African descendants, as these were their nannies, cooks, maids, servants, and many times responsible for their upbringing. 
Inevitably, these interrelationships left their mark on the criollos, and their behavior, customs, and every aspect of their lives were influenced. This process of indigenization or Africanization was one of the main reasons an attitude of superiority developed among the peninsulares. In a more practical sociopolitical space, criollos considered themselves Spaniards in every sense, but they were prevented from serving in public offices and even the priesthood sometimes lumped together with mestizos and mestizas. So that as early as the late 16th century, religious orders had already been instructed not to, not to ordain criollos or mestizos. These and other multiple intersecting factors created the right conditions to seek independence from Spain. The task of the emancipators would be to articulate the justification for the struggle. So here is the justification. Starting with Camilo Torres' Memorial de Agravios, many documents attempted to set the rhetorical and ideological state for, a stage for the independence from Spain. No other independista en criollo at the time had such determination to achieving the independence of his native land Caracas, Venezuela, and that of other regions as Simón Bolívar. No other independista showed the keen understanding of the reasons for which to pursue the independence from Spain. Commonly known as Simón Bolívar, this is a nice one. Simón José Antonio de la Santísima Trinidad de Palacios, de Bolívar y Palacios, became an orphan and rich at the age of 16. He then traveled to Europe, where he met his wife, Maria Teresa Rodríguez del Toro y Alaiza, in 1802, but she died nine months after of yellow fever. Bolívar tells us that the turning point of his political career was enabled by the death of his spouse, do not take any advice from this, which freed him to travel to Europe for a second time where he witnessed the crowning of Napoleon and which impressed in him the determination to go back to the Americas and struggle for their independence. So in 1810, Bolívar began to take a central role in the struggle of independence of South America. Bolívar's political ideas can be summarized in four documents. El Manifesto, El Manifiesto de Cartagena, 1810, La Carta de Jamaica, 1815, El Discurso de Argostura, 1819, and La Constitución de Bolivia, 1826. These four documents out outline his ideas concerning the peoples of the America, the reasons for emancipation from Spain, and the form of government most suitable for the Latin American nations. Of these, La Carta de Jamaica and the Discurso de Angostura are most important for our discussion of mestizaje. The documents are set apart by four years. In the former, that is, the Carta de Jamaica, Bolivar is making a desperate case for the cause of independence. In the latter, Discurso de Angostura, he displays greater debt, maturity, and sophistication in his political thought. La Carta de Jamaica was Bolivar's answer to some Henry Mullen and was written at a time when Bolivar has lost almost everything. The fight to free Venezuela, his own name, and the trust of his war allies. He was, as he himself writes, quote, a soldier in disgrace, impoverished and even undermined, end quote. Yet, inspired by the French Revolution, he found, he found the clarity to frame the struggle of independence on universal human rights as he's called to Criollos to enlist in the struggle for independence. He articulated three reasons for independence. One, the history of atrocities and exploitation of the Spanish conquistadors. That's the first one. He, he was informed by the La Leyenda Negra, or the black legend. Bolivar argues that if Spain had forfeited its right to, and claim to the land because of its violent, immoral invasion and extermination of the native peoples. Bartolomé de las Casas, a record of the atrocities of the Spaniards against the natives, was the most damning evidence. The Spanish crown, claimed Bolivar, was the unnatural stepmother that the Americans, that is meaning criollos, must fight against, and they were the monsters that made disappear the primitive race of the Americas. Two, Bolivar insisted that Spain had to be expelled because of how he treated its subjects. Really, he meant the criollos. The way Spain treated criollos resembled dynamics of slavery because they were not in control of their own affairs. 
The complaint was not disinterested. In terms of economics, most of the revenue resulting from commercial activities in the region ended up in the hands of the Spanish crown and, arist and its aristocracy. That, claimed Bolivar, had to change. In terms of political power, Bolivar insisted that Criollos were treated like infants in matters of government. They were prevented from accessing the higher positions of government, which were always given to the peninsulares. Because of that, Criollos had, who had ascended to such positions of government did not, take this, did not have the skills and know-how of governing their own people. As a result, Criollos existed in a state of infancy with regards to public affairs. And three, Bolivar insisted that Criollos represented a new body politic with double identity and dual citizenship. The Criollos, argued Bolivar, had equal rights with the Peninsulares, but they also had the, other right, had the added right uh, for the Americas. Because of their experience of existential and cultural intermixture, they cannot call themselves Spaniards. They were something else. They were American mestizos. They had a claim to Europe by blood and a claim to the Americas by birth. What was at stake for Bolivar was the new body politic emerging in the Americas, which stood in between the indigenous people and the Spaniards. It was a new breed, a mixed group of people who perceived themselves differently. They were the Criollos, Spaniards born in the Americas who had double rights. The same line of argumentation was followed in his Discurso de Angostura. In this paper, which he wrote on his way to Angostura, Bolivar would build upon La Carta de Jamaica. This time, his tone is tempered by the realization of the dangers and possibilities ahead. His idea has had mature, and his discourse conveyed a different political ethos. His primary concern was the formation of suitable forms of government for such heterogeneous population. Bolivar categorically rejects the possibilities of a constitutional monarchy that San Martin so adamantly had proposed during their interview in Ecuador. According to him, in order to build a true democracy, all titles of nobility and claims to aristocracy had to be removed from the social landscape. Similarly, the experience of federalism as expressed in the United States would not work for the Americas. The population of the Americas had, yet de had not yet developed the type of civic virtue necessary to make such form of government feasible. Bolivar's concern for a suitable form of government inspired him to adopt yet again mestizaje as a political rhetorical discourse for the construction of, this, of the new nations. So this is what he writes, quote, may I be permitted to call the attention of the Congress to a matter which can be of vital importance. Let us have present that our people are not the Europeans nor the North Americans. It is a composite of Africa and America. They are more than just an emanation of Europe, although Spain itself stops being Europe because of its African blood, its institutions, and its character. It is impossible to assign correctly to what family, human family we belong. Most of the indigenous have been annihilated. The European has mixed, with, has mixed with the American and with the African, and this has mixed with the Indian and the European. We are all born of the same mother, our fathers different in origin and in blood are strangers and all differ visibly in their epidermis. This unlikeness in the population brings a responsibility of great transcendence. So he sees this. He sees the phenomenal challenge of having such a heterogeneous population. So this is what he does. So Bolivar is conscious of the diverse character of its citizenry. Any form of government would not do in line of his centralist notions of government, the answer lied in the very intermixture. As he put it, unity, unity, unity must be our currency. The blood of our citizenship is different. Let us mix it to unite it. For Bolivar, the ideological construction of mestizaje was full of opportunities. Mestizaje became the symbolic banner of the birthing nations. The operating assumption was that mestizaje has an inherent potential of removing interethnic and intercultural differences. It represented the antidote to the chaos of difference and diversity. 
The adoption of the discursive universe of mestizaje provided the foundation for understanding and constructing the political and national imagery, imaginary, sorry, and allowed for claims of equality. If we were all mixed, we would all be equal. As he trickled down to the social dimension, and in contradiction to some who argued that the social caste were in fact the biggest obstacle in governing the new nations, Bolivar thought that this new understanding of the independent nations prevented interracial wars. Indeed, he acknowledged that everybody is naturally equal. Come on. The indigenous people and African descendants constituted the numeric majority of the population of the Americas. By comparison, the white criollos represented an insignificant minority, but such disparity was compensated by the natural, intellectual, moral, and strength superiority of the criollos. The natives were peaceful, he said. They had no quarrels with anyone, for they had been declared equals by law. If they had the opportunity to pursue honor and riches, they would not nor would they pursue education or public services for those aspirations they hate more than the desires for more than the desires for the benefits they bring. As for African descendants, they enjoy the privileges that come with the service of the Spanish masters. And even when they're instigated, they would not rebel, for they have been domesticated by religion. As to the mixed population, they they bring about a balance that is otherwise dangerous in, 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 in the face of the majority of the indigenous. So Bolivar's persuasive line of argumentation assumes the superiority of the criollos where it mattered most. It promoted mestizaje as the necessary condition for the legitimacy and differentiation of the criollos from the peninsulares and the Spanish crown, as in the case of La Carta de Jamaica. And it also provided the fruitful foundation upon which to construct the imaginary of the emerging nations, as in the case of the Discurso de Angostura. So let me close. As can be seen, Ricardo Fernstein, Garcilaso de la Vega, and Simón Bolívar display very different understandings of mestizaje. Each deploy mestizaje to name their own experience and reorient their inherent intellectual framing. However, there are serious points of disconnect in each of these authors. In the, in the case of Fernstein, his sense of history is truncated by the experience of migration. The original mestizaje that emerged from the encounter between indigenous and the Spaniards is but a faint memory that yields to the expressions, to the new expressions of intermixture. The larger history of the Americas has very little room in his own story of migration. By simultaneously embracing the present multicultural context of Argentina and dismissing the indigenous presence in the region, Fernstein invites us to engage in a process of historical amnesia. In the case of the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega, Mestizaje allowed him to reclaim his own indigenous ancestry, but not completely. His was an internal tug of war. He was hostage to his internalized racism and pushed him towards mimicry of the Spanish and self-loathing that moved him to reject his son because of his Indian features. In his writing, mestizaje took place at the expense of absorbing and assimilating the indigenous peoples, appropriating their traditions and symbols, and subsuming them under the emerging mestizo consciousness. As for Bolivar, Mestizaje provided the platform for distinguishing criollos from, from peninsulares. Because of the notion of mestizaje, criollos could claim their dual citizenship rights, imagine the construction of entire nations in, in the face of incredible diversity, and find the solution for internal race wars. But by framing mestizaje as necessary for the unity of these nation states, Bolivar unwittingly turned it into a mechanism that denied and removed differences and diversity. Bolivar's mestizaje promoted a synthesis that resulted in the homogenization of the population, which he saw necessary in order to build a new national imaginary. Thus, mestizaje for Bolivar was not intended for the construction of a nation where all are equal. Rather, it was used to hand over the privileges of the, the peninsulares onto the criollos. Each of these authors reveal intense tensions and contradictions. 
they display the complex contested dynamics inherent in the larger topography of discourses on mestizaje. At times, the use of mestizaje appears to celebrate diversity and multiplicity of identities, and at other times, it violently promotes homogeneity and denies differences, as in the case of Bolivar. At times, it is used to claim the multiple genealogical ancestries, and at others, it becomes a mechanism for whitening the population, as in the case of Ferenstein. Yet other times, it is used as celebration of the indigenous legacy and at other times to replace them with the new emerging mestizo identities, as in the case of Garcilaso de la Vega. Looking at mestizaje this way brings to light the deeply concealed racialized and gender intellectual frames under which these and other authors operate even as they attempt to interrogate inherited intellectual and social structures. While attempting to transcend learned intellectual frames, they overlook some of the pitfalls inherent in romanticized notions of unity and universality, which often come at the expense of diversity. Romanticized notions of intermixture posited as the solution for discrimination, and romanticized constructions of identity, which are often model, modeled after Eurocentric frames. Thank you.